that there is satisfaction to individuals in position of, of, of power. So th that was one thing. But then another question unrelated to that, it was about uh, uh, this paradox of voting. Right? So you said that uh, <coughs> Brennan and Lamasky had so they suggested the expressive model of voting. Right? It's really not that the voter thinks of the, what would satisfy, what outcome would satisfy his or her interest best, uh, but rather uh, there are other considerations having to do with uh, yeah, symbolic nature of voting, expressing itself, uh, telling uh, your mates. In my case, I think it's mostly doing what my wife says. <laughs> so it's, uh, I always work like she says. Yeah. Because it really doesn't affect anyway, right? So it's but it makes for good relation. <laughs> but but then there is another This is called strategic vote. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, there are other considerations. For example, uh, in the EU vote, uh, it's a vote that the Sweden should not be well I saw that I would vote for the proposal that would uh, not be Accepted because then probably whatever happens, people would not be pleased with the result. So I could always say I voted for the other side. But, <laughs> and that's also something. But what I was thinking of is that uh, isn't there uh, another model of voting? Perhaps not for those large electorate, but it's of impersonal. So you, instead of thinking what's good for me, you are thinking what's good, right? what's best. Uh, and this actually creates problem. Right? If everyone votes how he or she thinks is best, then pr presumably the result is not going to satisfy uh, the preferences of the people. But, so this seems to be a sort of, even if people are sort of very serious, right? but in another sense, they, they are sort of they are raising stuff about the personal level to the level of community, well, then you get this paradoxical effect that uh, the result won't be that satisfactory. Okay, thank you very much. Shall I respond? That's my question, yes. <laughs> um, public choice is criticized uh, for being pessimistic about human nature. Uh, and of course, the last point you mentioned as well, as well it's, it's, it's criticized for suggesting that voters just think like self-interested consumers. And that's represented as being a cynical view of human nature. Uh, and in fact, worse than that, many critics have suggested that because the public choice is the name of this Virginia public choice school that you kind of founded, which is really, it's almost like the church which supports this particular model of democracy. It's got a negative and a positive side, uh, at least that's one way of seeing it. The negative side, which upsets a lot of people, is this one you mentioned, a very, very pessimistic picture of human nature. <clears throat> and the suggestion that we're all just homo economicus, we're all just in it for number one. And as I was just going to say, this is reinforced by the extra criticism still on this negative point, that not only does it give a poor reflection of human nature, it gives a reflection of human nature that people in office internalize, and that actually drives them to behave as the model says it should behave. In the model, after all, there are producers and the consumers, and I stressed how the consumers are supposed to be purchasing policies with a view to their self-interest. But equally, of course, producers, political parties, are supposed to be producing policies in their self-interest. In other words, only producing the policies that will maximize the chance of their being re-elected. Equally, those in government, in the bureaucracy, are assumed themselves to be interested just in their careers or their prospects. This is all part of having the same model of human nature for both the polity and the economy. And now, they, on the negative side, people have resisted not just the cynical image of human nature, but the fact, as they see it, that putting forward that model that this is how people are in politics can tend to make them be that way politics. There's a nice little, I don't know if many of you know these uh, 
these various experiments that psychologists uh, do nowadays on how altruistic people will be. So there are these little games you can play, things like the ultimatum game, you know, which involves things like uh, there are two of you in the game, one of you is given $10, and you are told that uh, you've got to offer an amount to the other person, and if the other person refuses what you give them, then neither of you gets anything. But if they accept their share, then you both get what, what's allocated. So you might think, well, I'll be really nice. I'll give him $9. Well, you can be sure he'll accept it. She'll accept it. And you'll both get, you'll only get a dollar. You might think, well, maybe I can go to $5 each. And of course, generally, that's regarded as still pretty altruistic. But you know, someone who was really egoistic might think, well, I'm going to hold on to $9, right? Because he's not going to sneeze at a dollar. It might be only $1. But you know, one dollar is a dollar, you know, so you take it and I'll get my nine, that'd be great. Right? That's how you'd predict that someone relatively self-interested would, would go. Now the interesting thing is a lot of people point out that the only people in these experiments who ever go for the nine one or the eight two or who try to really drive, you know, something are those who studied economics. <laughs> and that's I that's because they've learned, so to speak, that that's the clever, intelligent, you know, that's how you're supposed to behave in the market. You know, you go for your self-interest, so to speak. Now, people legally, it's just a public choice, can actually corrupt politics by telling politicians, no one's a statesman, forget about that. Um, what's the line used to be? A politician is someone in public office who thinks about the next election. A statesman is someone in public office, or a statesperson, who thinks about the next generation. The argument is, there are no statesmen in politics. Everyone is states presence. Everyone's a politician. Now, if you say that often enough, people believe, and then you make the case, you know, I'm going on too long with this. So that's the negative aspect of it. That's for sure. People tend to reject that. I haven't talked about whether that's correct or, or wrong. I will later. That will come into the, the last lecture. So let me not talk about it much now. The other side, of course, of public choice is that precisely because of having this negative view of human nature, they, they run well. This is a more positive thing. They have a very uh, keen eye for reforms that should be brought in in government. Now, some of the reforms will just simply say you should minimize government because it always creates poor variables. It always creates resources that people can try to, as it were, break off for themselves. So you try to minimize government. That's one blanket result. And I guess that's most people also feel negatively about that. But um, and they will also argue that people in the bureaucracy can't be trusted because you can't put enough controls on them. And maybe you might feel not so good about that, but they also argue in fairness that, uh, many of them, that you should block campaign financing, for example. Well, that's the case of buying off parties, you know, in favor of the very rich. They're not for that particularly. They're also in favor of far more controls on political parties and so on. So it's a mixed message on that side. I'm talking to her to great length, because I'm sure I've some good things to say, but I was I was going to be more right. But. What about this second thing about uh, the impersonal model of voting, voting for the best and not for the best for me? Well, of course, on their model, you'll always vote your self-interest, rather than voting the common no, good, no, right? No, not on the public choice model, but if you think of voting, the, you said that, yeah. that there is one, this, uh, competitive more well the proposal by Brennan and Tomaski that really it's a question of expression of one's personality or something like that. But the other would be you no know, the voting uh, sometimes is done by those convenient uh, moral people that uh, Okay Brennan uh, what Brennan and Tomaski argue is, is as follows. They say if each of us is an instance of home economicus, if you're just interested in personal returns, mm -hmm. right? Then, ironically, you won't vote for our outcome policies when you go to the polls, if you go to the polls. You won't vote outcome, you'll vote posture, if you want to put it that way. You will vote in the way that, as where well, makes you feel most satisfied with yourself or enables you with greatest ease to present yourself to other people in a way you'd like to be able to present yourself. Because that's where the returns are. You're not going to affect the outcome, but you are going to affect your own posture. Now, question, are people actually instances of home economicus, are they as self-serving as that? And that's, a, that's a, another big question. That's the one that I will come up in the fourth lecture, but let me say very briefly, maybe if you like what, 
right, and the standard ones. I think that um, I think that no, in general, we're not like that. I think though some of us are often like many of us, all of us are sometimes like that, and maybe some of us are always like that. But it's certainly not the case that all of us are always like that. Most of us, I think, much of the time, can manage to think in quite public spirited terms. On the other hand, I think that's true and that's important. But I think in institutional design, you do have to be careful that you don't design institutions that will only work well if everybody's behaving really public spiritedly. Because if you do that, you make your institutions vulnerable to the naive, so to speak, to the odd, or to, and people look at the very fact that you can gain personal advantage under a given system can create a motive for becoming someone interested in personal advantage. Do you remember Plato's Ring of Gyges? The Ring of Gyges was the ring which you could put on and it made you invisible. And once you're invisible, under this story, it's all from Plato, but Plato makes use of it. Once it's on, once you're invisible, you can do what you like. You can steal what you like. You can you know, do all sorts of naughty <coughs> things, you know. And, and no one will know. You can do it with complete impunity. And a good question, even if you don't believe that we're all naturally self-interested, even if you think that there is there are two sides to us, or much of the time we're very public spirited, a good question is how many of us would be resistant to the charms of the Ring of Gyges? I mean, how many of us, if we really were given opportunities with impunity to benefit ourselves, would, are absolutely sure that we wouldn't? I mean, very few of us, I think, would feel that self-assurance. Very few of us would feel that assurance about other people, maybe less assurance about other people. That being the case, I think it's important you don't create temptations in your public institutions, and that you create institutions that have protections against people behaving like maids. At the same time that I am anticipating the last lecture, you dare to create institutions that drive out virtue. See, there's, there's some institutions that are so cautious about not letting the name take over that they make everybody feel like he or she is under suspicion, right? Because there are so many protections and guards and monitoring. And of course, we know in the matter of human psychology that if you're treated like a knave, you tend actually to behave like a knave. And yet, that's a, the example I often give of that is a case I knew of once where a manager comes into a hospital where there's a social work unit. I happen to know the, knew the people in the unit. All of them at work, at least 25% longer hours than they needed to do, because they were very devoted professionals. The manager comes in, what's this, we've got no check. And when these people come in, when they go out, what they're doing, tries to institute a check of clocking in and clocking out and writing a report of what's done in every five minutes. What would you predict happens under that system? Well, of course, people work less than they did under the other system, because now their virtue is driven out. You're treated like a maid. There's no trust, there's no sense of your earning esteem or anything. So there's a real issue here about institutional design. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm wondering to what extent that the, that the model of the rule of the populace presupposed a certain picture of man. You contrast the rule of the populace with the rule of public and uh, the rule of public. That's a uh, the difference here is different pictures of uh, what constitutes a group, which we consider a group as a um, collective intentional agent, which you um, but in the, the market model here, you, you, it's built on a certain picture of man as thermoeconomical. But couldn't you reject the picture of man as thermoeconomical and leave room for some of the moral considerations without uh, accepting? and still reject uh, the idea of collective intentional agents. So you would be left with the rule of the problem, but not. Well, I, I think that you put your finger on something really interesting here. I mean, here are two models of, of human nature, if you like, just very crudely. One is homo economicus, and the other is what used to be called sometimes, although it's a terrible etymology, homo sociologicus, right? Sociological, man, human, and, and, and economic. 
Now, the economic is conceived certainly as an agent that has a utility function, a probability function, that always acts, and the utility function in particular with, as we say, a pretty self-interested utility function. I mean, utilities derive from their own satisfaction. And they act with relentless rationality to maximize their own utility, right? Expected utility in terms of, that's the model. Now, it's true that in that model, and I think that model does affect people. So when someone you know, like Benton, who's already you know, involved in something close to that model, is thinking, well, how could there be a, you know, they're just individual human beings. They're each driven by their own probability and utility function, by their own sort of self-interest in that sense. And um, what do you expect them to be safe? But how would you get a, he says, a community or a group agent anyhow? You're always going to have just these people pumping away at producing their own interest. Now, homo sociologicus, the one thing that's emphasized in that tradition is that people wear different hats. They play roles. They can sometimes act in a purely personal role, but sometimes they can act as a departmental chair. You know, who, as departmental, you are the chair at the moment. As departmental chair, you you take on the interests of the department, you know, and you go perhaps to the central administration and you argue on behalf of the department, right? And maybe, actually, personally, you'd be better off under some arrangement, which you don't think is very bad for the department. You'd be a very bad departmental head if you allowed that to intervene. Uh, do you remember Mayor Daly, the last Mayor Daly, when he was mayor of Chicago, a very famous remark? It was found that he had given a lot of Gee, I hope I'm not plagiarizing that, but I believe it had been, uh, not plagiarizing, but of uh, misreporting him, defaming him. It was said of him that he had reported that he had given various city contracts in Chicago to the firm for which one of his sons worked. And this was a major brouhaha. Papers came out, this is terrible, the mayor is going to Daly came on television and he said, so how would you expect a good father to behave? <laughs> it's, it's really only in America could you get away with it, but he actually got away with it. And on most of his field, you know, there's a sort of behavioral profile that goes with the role. Most of us think we're capable of some rather shifting. Now, how you explain that psychologically, that's another issue. Whether it's really consistent, maybe with decision theories, I think it is. That's another issue too. But once you've got the idea of playing a role, you can have the idea of a group agent, right? Because people can just, as it were, take on. They know their part. They play their part. And so far as they each play a coordinated set of parts, you can create a group agent. We'll be talking about that the next day. Under the other image, you might think that that's impossible, at least under some versions of it. So OK, so perhaps there are different images of human nature that are correlating with these images of, of the people. I think it's fairly well accepted that on the model, like as you described it, uh, politics becomes very problematic and any reading Hayek or whomever of the authors that have sort of tried to establish this. You might want to say, what you're doing is you're taking politics as we understand it in the democratic tradition and you're saying this does not really work for that. Somebody who would sort of try to be trying to be an advocate of that tradition might want to say, okay, we have to rethink politics and democracy rather than the public choice theory. So I, I want to ask you is, I mean, um, how should we respond to somebody who would want to argue that? Um. Let me say, first of all, how I think that it's a little bit like what I said earlier. There's a system out there that works pretty well. I mean, in order to say it, it's very complex. We call it the polity, right? Uh, just as the economy is terribly complex and we only half understand it, similarly the polity too, involving adjustments and alignments between people, etc., etc. Now, public choice represents a way of looking at that and saying, here's the way to see it. The way to see it is it's just like a market, right? So it's, it, this is constitutional political philosophy, as I was calling it earlier. It's sort of saying, come with me, <coughs> see this following gestalt, you know, this following pattern, 
in how things are. And here's why you should see it that way. One, it'll let you see the sense in which it's democratic without invoking any sort of collective people. Two, it'll let you see ways in which you might want to improve it. Right? You can see ways in which it's, it's actually not living up to the Gestalt, which you've been invited to see in it. Right? So the public choice there is to say, it is just like a market, but look, it isn't working all that well, I grant. And here's what we should revise, for example. As a market, it's putting monopoly power in the hands of, say, campaign financiers. Most of us would probably agree. We should break that. Or it's putting too much power in the hands of a bureaucracy that's not responsible. For you should break that, it will say. Or it will, and so on, through a whole range of things. And thirdly, it says, and hey, it's not a bad idea. You know, it's really quite attractive, the idea. Now, what I've said against that is, actually, this isn't really a model of what's out there that's very accurate to what's out there. Because as a matter of fact, what's out there involves these weaknesses on the side of electoral demand, electoral supply, electoral choice. It's only got the faintest resemblance, I want to say, in criticism to really a market in which voters were consumers and political parties were producers. It's not really like that. That's a false gestalt. And I also want to say that in case it isn't really a model of democracy. Now, you say, well, the fault is in, OK, you can do that. I say, Sorry, I'm thinking out loud with you. Uh, so you say, well, suppose I come back at you and I say, well, the fault isn't in public choice theory. The fault is in reality, you know? As in public choice theory gives us an image of how things might be. That would be much better than how they are. Okay, at one level, actually, I agree. I think there's a possible world, so to speak, in which you might be able to manage things so the public choice theory was an accurate account of how things were working, and maybe, and I also would grant it's probably better in many ways than what we actually have. But the thing about that possible world is it would have to be a possible world in which you got over problems of the kind I mentioned, like electoral demand. So somehow that you'd have to get people to be prepared to vote their interests and the outcomes rather than voting their posture, as I was putting it, for example. You'd also have to get a set of rules that we could indeed all more or less agree on or at least belong to a family. Maybe you could do that too. Uh, where most of us felt that it's a decent aggregation set of rules. You'd have to break monopoly in some way, have freedom of supply you know, on the side. Of course, you could easily, I suppose, break campaign financing and dependencies of that kind. Um, but you'd also have to get over the pre-packaging and the pre-sizing, as I call it, of policies. Now, as you put in these different elements, it's awfully hard to see, really. At least to my eye, it's hard to see how, how you could really get something that worked to the ideal of public choice theory. And that's why I'm inclined to say, you know, the theory is not adequate to any, the way things are, or the way things could even be feasibly made to be. In that sense, it's inadequate. So I'm inclined to say the faults in the theory, not in the reality, even though the reality, of course, is improvable. Um, this, this problem about pre-packaging and, and pre-sizing, um, the extent to which that so I mean, doesn't that depend on um, what our preferences look like in this, this area? I mean, in, in certain areas, we sort of have very fine-grained preferences. Um, um, but in this area, we might have sort of just rough pre preferences about certain sort of vague uh, ideas or, or values that we want to see implemented. And in that case, then, I mean, given that certain packages embody these ideas, then it might not be a great problem that they come in packages. Maybe I've overstated those problems. I, I, see, I see what you mean. That, um, well, let, let me paint it in alternative scenario. Suppose you had a, of course, it would have also some other faults, but suppose you had an, an electoral world in which there were many, many different parties, right? And these parties, for any given policy, you could find a lot of variations on that policy, fine grade variations, not just crude alternatives. And for any such fine grade policy, you could find it matched with a whole range of other policies. So you've got 
over the free sizing problem, and you got over the free packaging problem. So you get a whole range of things. Of course, you would have other problems in such a in such a world, which is we'd all be dazzled by choice. Uh, I can quite see that. But if we're just looking at it from the point of view of, of what we individually want, actually, it's a bit it's a bit hard. This is we said about this like this in Sweden, the buying different mobile phones, cell phones, sort of packages. You know, you can vary the plan, you know, so that you can make local calls or distant calls. It doesn't seem to ring bells, does it? Maybe Sweden is different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can see, all right, maybe people would, would prefer the coarser packages rather than those fine because they'd be dazzled with all the variety and would not even be able to compare them. Um, okay, if that's the case, then that particular line of criticism isn't going to, isn't going to cut, cut very deeply. On that particular um, side, which is the side of um, electoral supply, <laughs> actually, I think the far more important one, and this, I suppose, under a certain work might be put right, is the, what I call the organizational and financial costs of getting a new party together. Because we know you know organization is a real problem. So, I mean, you just look at most European polities. I mean, how many occasions in the last 75 years has a European democracy or any democracy work like for that matter, generated a new party. Now it has happened maybe two dozen times across the democratic world, with not much more open than that. Because parties change as good as well and actually fit into the One sort of, it's not indiscipline as in psychological indiscipline, it's lack of discipline as in the depend on the smaller party. But the other, uh, the, in the Washington system, remember what happens, it's, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I've only moved to America three years ago, I've become really attuned to how it happens through being there and reading the press every day and so on. And it's, it's a stunning system. It's very, it has got other virtues, but in this respect, it's truly amazing. Because the legislature are elected quite independently of the administration, what does this mean? Well, it means that the administration, the executive, does not have to depend on getting a majority in, in the legislature in order to stay in existence, which is what happens in a system like the Swedish one or in the Westminster system. That means, in turn, that there is no tight party discipline within the legislature, which you have to have in the other system, or else the government will always fall and you'll be replaced. They can go anywhere they like. Now, that means, in turn, that on any given issue, members of Congress may divide on lines that are only very loosely party lines. That means anyone who puts up any, any issue to be voted upon 
can't depend on having a majority just through the party being a majority party in Parliament, in Congress, they will have to manufacture a majority because they're not going to get anyone from the other party, certainly, without buying them off. So how do they buy them off? Well, they buy them off by offering them, they add other things into the bill. You know these umbrella, umbrella bills? So for example, notoriously, just last year, there were two bridges built in Alaska. You know, you had, well, just recently, a bill is going through for military expenditure. And there are a whole series of things added at the bottom of the bill. As in, and we'll build a utility in Tennessee to serve blah, 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 and a bridge will be built. In, in Alaska, they built a bridge costing $3 million going to an island with seven families on it. They're building another bridge as large as the, as the Golden Gate, I'm told, costing untold millions, again serving only a handful of people. And this is all because the Senator from Alaska was the, he was also the chair of the Finance Committee, <laughs> which, which helps too. But so you can have this thing happening, but equally now what happens is the lobby groups, right, are poised like sharks, you know, on either side. Because now you can buy off a particular member of Congress. If you go to a member of a government party in a system like this, and you say, uh, you know, I'm not going to support you in the next election, or we put up a candidate against you, or we, you know, will, whatever it might be, um, unless you vote our way, he'll say, or she'll say, look, I've got to vote for the party. So it means lobby groups have got to buy off the whole party. It's very difficult. In America, you can pick off particular representatives because they're not tied to party voting. And it goes on and on and on. But the result is there's a very little correlation between what's actually said to the electorate and what happens at the other end. I mean, I, might, I, I can understand that this is a problem. But if you take you know, the model, the model says uh, democracy should work, or it does work almost as the market does. Uh, but, and then you say, well, it's problematic because you buy uh, these policies and they are not delivered. But do you really buy policies? Because we are all, you know, we do see these things, so we know what we're buying. I mean, of course, if the system is as erratic as the American seems to be, that's quite problematic. But say, for instance, in Sweden, that we know that if we work, work for instance, for the social democracy, we are, in fact, working for a coalition. So we know that. So we know that, okay, they are saying this, but probably there will be, you know, these discussions. So we, but we buy it anyway, and we will have it delivered. We will have something like what was promised uh, during um, speeches. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, so it's not, I mean, it sounds so, so simple. You, you buy particular policies and they are not delivered. But if we are rational, it could come in. Yeah. Even in the, on the economic market, we know that we will be, uh, we will be tricked and we will not get exactly what we buy. It will not look at on the picture when I go to McDonald's. It won't look this perfect and crispy. It will be soggy and discolored. But I know that and I buy it anyway. So. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm not sure about where, where the, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah. Uh, but the, I'm not sure where the, where the common trees. I mean, one way I guess is, you might think that it's, it's Chris Michael. I mean, as in it's saying, look, Anyone that says that there's a perfect sort of market up there and you like it, it's so far from that, you know. So, or you might take it as pro this model, I guess, as saying that, well, okay, I mean, if you want to, if you want to talk about a model on which we're supposed to be picking policies or even packages of policies, then, but, but it is a model of how we pick, well, what you might call it, we pick lotteries, you know, we pick gamuts, you know, we pick like a, uh, a roulette wheel. I love that roulette wheel over there that gives me a 50% chance of having this package and a 40% chance of having the other package, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so it gets sort of okay, but now it's looking it's looking like it's, it's looking like the sort of market none of us would really like the shopping much, you know. Wherein you go in to buy, but just as you're about to buy, well you get struck down with this thing about how it feel like, you know, you forget about real demand, right? And then when you uh, when you actually go to spend on what you know will be just like a, an impulse that will take you over, that's to pick up the expressive voting bit, you'll find that actually there's very little on, on sale around here. You know, private side now I want to look, oh, I've got to buy, I've got to get a hamburger and a suit. I don't want a suit. And I've got, you know, it's all packaged together, and I've only got this size, only size 10, no size 1.5, right? But you know, okay, that's second. But then you find 
if you actually spend your money, what you have, on an impulse basis to buy these very restricted French goods, well, there's only a chance, really, you'll get them. You know, you might get, actually, quite a different sort of selection or package. I mean, that, that's, that's how it is. That's exactly how it is. Now, the trouble is, we all laugh, as we describe it, because it's sort of, it really, it's a very, very strange market. It's like a Monty Python market, really, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't answer to, as it were, the high ideal we were presented of thinking of it as a model of the economy in which the people are doing our self -care. I mean, this is such a loose sort of self-determination. And that's what I mean simply by saying, actually, it's, it's very good for doing probably the most important job of all. And I shouldn't really be taking to mark this at all. This is deadly serious. It is the only system for governing succession between governments. It's the one and only way I think of doing it. Short of a lottery, actually. That would be another way, except I think in all sorts of ways the lottery wouldn't have legitimacy if that this does have. It's great at that, but it isn't much good at anything else. It doesn't really give us an image of the people who are themselves. I think we have a last question before we go upstairs and have a drink and continue. In answering your, your last question on whether democracy is normatively attractive, yes. you pointed to this, that uh, democracy is preferable because it breaks uh, the line of the dynasty or it's, it is better than monarchy. Isn't that a uh, false belief to me? Because uh, you leave uh, democracy is perhaps not the only alternative. It could be Can I just say one thing? This isn't really democracy, it's, it's the electoral system I'm saying does yes, that. Because yes. I don't think the electoral system, just having that, deserves to be called democracy yet. Oh, in yes. sense. But, but sorry, I interrupted you. Perhaps some kind of anarchy would be uh, fulfill the public choice model better. You said also said that the uh, public choice model leads leads us to, uh, uh, democracy has to rule in severe limits, but perhaps a public choice model will lead us to reject democracy altogether, to some kind of, uh, perhaps, private property anarchy with private justice system. Have you considered that? I think that libertarianism, <coughs> of which public choice, with which is very closely aligned, uh, really at an extreme goes very close to anarchism. I mean, take someone like Nozick, in anarchy state in utopia. I mean, he won't have even a minimal state. He has what I already know anybody calls a non-minimal state, a very, very thin state indeed. And that gets very close, and he actually, hence the title of the book, I mean, he he thinks that as were the first choice for a, a libertarian of that kind should be anarchy, except he then argues that if you did get anarchy, in which people looked after themselves, etc., etc., but were fairly moral, they didn't Reach one another's rights. Sorry, that's not quite right, but uh, we weren't so sure about other people, I suppose, that they would still set up, end up setting up an ultra minimal state. That's his justification of it. But you're absolutely right about that. Now, let me just say one thing, though, about the public choice model. Historically, it's quite interesting. The public choice model was developed by economists. Out, I would say, of generally the utilitarian tradition that I've mentioned. James Mill is in the background there. But immediately prior to the public choice theory of democracy, you had had a different economic theory of democracy, as it was often called, or an economic theory of the state. And that was, you get that, for example, in Paul Samuelson's work. I mean, in the mid-50s, mid-60s, it was the orthodoxy until public choice took over. And the one thing it emphasized was that there are some goods which the market, and therefore anarchy, because you know, anarchy would have only a market, nothing else which the market isn't good at producing, these so-called public goods. These are goods which are basically non-excludable. So if they're produced, everybody gets them, regardless of whether or not they're paid for them. And the argument is that, well, I'm not going to spend my money, even if I could afford to, buying something that may benefit me, but benefits everybody else equally, even if they haven't paid. In any case, no one person will probably be able to buy it, and you get a problem in a market as to why anyone would buy it. So for example, defense is thought to be like this, or law and order is thought to be like this, or maybe guarding against uh, keeping the water clean, keeping the air clean in the country. These are public, non-excludable goods. Now that argument that Samuelson and others was that you need the state, ideally a democratic state, they would say, to produce for those goods. That's why anarchy isn't a good idea. 
Public choice theorist people, they came along and they criticized Samuelson et al., those people, for their great belief in the state. They said, you're treating the state as if it's bound to be benign, as if it's bound to, you know, be a, a state of, a government of do-gooders. But actually, can you expect that? Because they said, after all, we know from the market that people behave in a self-interested way. Wouldn't they do that in government as well? And so their model is developed in critique of that model. But the one thing they don't give up on is the, in developing the critique, they don't give up on the idea that there are at least some public goods. And they think there are at least some goods that you need a market for. And hence, I think that will always block a slide into full anarchy from the public choice model.